Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Malloy, and I'm the creative director of the Wild Writers Literary Festival. This is our 10th anniversary, and we are in our final weekend of the festival. So I'm glad you could join us this afternoon. Um, this festival is brought to you by the New Quarterly uh, Literary Magazine, uh, Wordsworth Books, and the Balsillis School of International Affairs. Um, I'd also like to thank our uh, uh, festival donors and sponsors, including the Ontario Arts Council, the NAP Wealth Management Team of RBC Dominion Securities, and Audie Kitchener Waterloo. Um, and now I'm going to introduce our moderator, and also uh, Claire's going to be doing moderating and be part of the discussion herself because she does have a, a, a knowledge of podcasts. Hi, Claire. So Claire is Claire Tayson is the author of In Search of the Perfect Singing Flamingo, which was the 2019 Hamilton Reed selection. Her first novel in the field was the winner of the 2010 Metcalf Rook Award, and her short fiction has been published for the Bronwyn Wallace Award, the CBC Literary Prize, and has appeared in various journals and anthologies. She has an MFA from the University of British Columbia and has been a lecturer at St. Jerome's University since 2011. She also spearheaded the podcast project of the New Quarterly called Parallel Careers, a monthly podcast about the dual lives of writers who teach. And now I will get off screen and have Claire introduce our, our guest today. Thanks so much for that welcome, Pamela. Um, welcome to all of you who are watching. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. I'm coming to you from Treaty 3 territory in Guelph and we have until about four o'clock together. I'm hugely honored to be here with these two guests who I might invite to, you can go ahead and turn your cameras back on. It's one of the first times that we've had a podcasting panel at Wild Writers, and I just think there's so much to cover with this topic. Um, I'll be walking the line as both a participant and a moderator. Uh, we're going to start, I'll introduce the two guests, and um, I'm going to invite them to talk a little bit about their project first. We'll talk about the reasons why we started these projects some possibilities for podcasting as a medium. And then we'll also open it up to questions. So as you have questions, please pop them in the Q&A box and we will do our best to get through as many as we can. So if you've ever listened to NPR programming, you've probably already heard Chioki Iansen's voice um, since 2016. He has been one of the voices of NPR delivering sponsorship and different underwriting messages. He's also a professor of African American studies at Virginia Commonwealth University and the director of the community media at uh, sorry the director of community v media at VPM plus ICA Community Media Center. And we're going to be hearing a lot about that center today. Chioki has a bachelor's degree in philosophy and religion from FAMU and a PhD in philosophy from the University of South Florida. Chioki is also an audio fiction enthusiast, and I'd highly encourage you to check out his SoundCloud um, Chismatic for some of his interpretations of short stories, as well as some of his own radio work. So welcome, Chioki. Um, Thank you. Oh. <laughs> please, please, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no. I was going to say, oh, my God, please don't say anything more about me. But, but thankfully, <laughs> you've you moved on. <laughs> Um, well, Gishik Rice is an author and journalist from Wasoxing First Nation. He's written three fiction titles, um, Midnight Sweat Lodge, Legacy, and Moon of the Crusted Snow. Uh, Moon of the Crusted Snow, as many of you already know, is just an unforgettable slow burn of a book. And I'm so thrilled to say that The Moon of the Turning Leaves, the sequel to it, is coming out spring 2023 with Penguin Random House and HarperCollins. Um, Web short stories and essays have been published in many anthologies, including Locations of Grief and Emotional Geography, which came out recently with Woolsack and Wynn. Uh, Wob graduated from the journalism program from the university formerly known as Ryerson and spent most of his journalism career with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation as a video journalist and a radio host. He left in 2020 to focus on his literary career, and since then he started the Story Keepers podcast with Jennifer David. So there are nine episodes already out. The next one launches um, early in December, so please check that out. So I hope we could start, if you wouldn't mind introducing the podcast or the center. Um, Wab, do you mind starting us off telling us a bit about the Storykeepers podcast? 
Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for your introduction, Claire, and thanks to the festival for uh, bringing us together virtually today. It's uh, it's an honor and a joy to uh, be able to visit with you all this afternoon. So miigwech, thank you very much. Um, Story Keepers is pretty much, um, I guess, a monthly book club podcast in, in a way. And it was Jennifer David's idea. She first reached out to me um, back when I lived in Ottawa about six or seven years ago. Uh, but it, it, with this idea of um, an Indigenous literature podcast, uh, I couldn't take it on at the time because I was still working at CBC. Uh, but when she found out I left CBC last uh, spring, she came knocking again and asked me if I wanted to uh, give it a shot. So her idea was to uh, do an episode every month about uh, a book by an Indigenous author, whether it's a classic one or a recent one, and would bring in a guest host, um, you know, another Indigenous writer or artist or filmmaker or somebody else, right? And we'd just talk about the book itself. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to apply for some funding through the Ontario Arts Council to get things started. And uh, that's basically what it is, you know, the, the feedback so far has been great. It's been really fun. Um, we have a pretty sort of laid back approach to it. Um, but we just want to open the circle, you know, open the conversations about Indigenous literature and, and from an Indigenous perspective to not just, I guess, uh, show Indigenous people the literary works that are out there, but to bridge gaps between communities, uh, to bring non-Indigenous people into the conversation to learn about why we are so passionate about these books. So um, it's been a lot of fun so far. Thank you. Um, Chiuki, do you want to jump in and talk about the Centre? Yeah, sure. So um, what's, what, what's to say? The VPM ICA Community Media Center is a production studio and workspace that is like kind of located inside of a museum here in Richmond, Virginia. And our mission is to just help anyone who wants to learn, uh, like tell their stories better. So if you just think about maybe you want to do a podcast or you've been producing something and you want to improve it, we have resources to help, whether it be like technical stuff or like bringing guests to do workshops or even like hearing pitches and doing like pitch development. And so we do all of that for free and we'll soon branch out into other media. And here's a picture of what it looks like. Yeah. I remember on the the um, the launch that I was lucky enough to attend online. I think it might still be on YouTube if people are interested. Um, you said that when you envisioned it, you thought it would be kind of a drab space, but it's like functional yeah. space. But you can see in that picture, like it's so beautiful. Yeah, I mean, you know, we. Yeah, I thought so long as it has a recording studio and some computers, we'll be good. But the people at this museum who decided to like take it on were like, yo, dog, we can't have it be looking all basic. Like it's literally if you come here, you'll see that this place is literally in the back of a gallery like it's in, it's in an art gallery. So the, the only way to do it was to go big. And that's what that's what they decided to do. And, but I'm I'm terribly excited that they did because. Uh, I think that very often our production equipment is kind of basic. It's like the computer, the microphone, but th what it, th its potential could be anything. And so this is a studio that wears its potential on the outside, if you will. What an amazing space for a student to get to um, learn in as well. I, I, that's the goal. I brought my, I'm teaching my podcasting class here now, and uh, they, they really dig it. They really did. They also dig like just having being able to grab a microphone and go record something. Thank you. Uh, so you both mentioned a little bit about it, but I wonder if we can dig a little bit deeper into um, why you started the project and what you think the need for it or what need it fills. So for me, I might talk a little bit about parallel careers, which as Pamela mentioned is it's a monthly podcast. The tagline is where writers who also teach share the big ideas and practical tips that they take into the classroom. So I'm a sessional instructor. I love my job. I love teaching. I love seeing students become excited about developing their own voice. Um, but I, I have like very few professional development opportunities because I'm a sessional instructor. Um, I think for a long time in academia, there was kind of this idea that if you're a researcher, you're going to be a great teacher. And so not much time was spent on developing um, teaching skills and um, thinking about that really intentionally. 
So I did get some money a few years ago to go to a conference and um, it was in Toronto. So there was very little money for travel um, so I could attend it. Um, and I remember sitting in on this one session in particular that was led by Sarah E. Mei Tiang and Ian Williams, Sherita Warner and Ann Simpson. And they were just talking about different exercises they used with their students. They were talking about ways they were rethinking the workshopping model. And I remember like almost thrumming with excitement in the audience, just thinking like, this is what I was so hungry for. This is how I want to get better as an instructor. So I left that thinking, you know, how can I take this um, kind of learning that was available at the conference and how could we make it accessible for people who can attend that conference? Um, how can it be ongoing um, and how can it be, I guess, free? And so I pitched it to the new quarterly. They were super enthusiastic. So I'm hoping that this podcast will reach people who um, are creative writing instructors, but also who are writers who just don't have the ability to say access writing courses or to access a writing group and who want to work on their own work as well. So I guess that was kind of the need that that one fills. Um, Chiyoki, maybe do you want to start first this time? Um, talking about what need the center fills. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, I've been I've been like a professory person for a long time, and w what I always note is that in my students, they have good ideas that feel more like potential than ideas. And so, you know, as a I'm a I'm a I've been a philosopher I'm a philosopher by training. So, if we go back to like uh, Plato's Theaetetus. There's this whole thing where Socrates says that he's a midwife for ideas, right? So he produces the conditions whereby people can kind of give birth to these to these good ideas, and um, that's kind of been the thing that I've been trying to do as a professor all this time. But of course, the the student population are a very particular population, and I wanted to take this activity of like helping others develop, especially in their storytelling to just everybody. So that the media center isn't only for students, it's for anybody at all and it's and it's 100% free. So, uh, so then this is part of the goal. I also think that anyone who is like particularly good at storytelling or is very good at media production becomes good also at media consumption and criticality. And I, I also think that there, it's no longer possible to have critical thinking in like in a modern society without media literacy. So this is my roundabout way of contributing to that good. Thank you, that's great. Um, uh, maybe, well, do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, story keepers and um, some of the need you think that that's filling? Yeah. Um... I don't think Story Keepers is that unique of an idea. There are already some podcasts that focus on Indigenous literature out there already. Uh, there's one called Book Woman that's um, hosted by three Métis librarians out west of Saskatchewan. Uh, Good Minds, the organization, has a podcast hosted by uh, Mohawk and Tuscarora poet uh, Janet Rogers. Um, but what we wanted to do was, I guess, contribute to those conversations uh, and at the same time try to... Uh, put a spotlight on the diversity of Indigenous voices within the literary world. So our objective from the beginning was to, I, I think, cover a uh, broad landscape, uh, both literally and figuratively, um, culturally as well. And, um, and part of bringing in a third person every month, uh, I think, hopefully gets uh, to that objective. Um, because, you know, uh, there is no pan indigenous experience, right? Uh, we're not a homogenized group. We all have different cultures, different languages, different experiences, whether it's on reserve or, or urban. Uh, and I think when we first started planning the podcast, we made a long list of the books we wanted to do, but also a long list of the people we wanted to bring in. And we wanted to make sure we reflected the diversity of uh, indigenous nations right across the land in doing that. Um, not just culturally, but uh, gender, um, or, you know, um, uh, yeah, like we wanted to make sure we had as many women voices, uh, two-spirit LGBT voices as well um, in doing that. So, uh, yeah, as a result, I think what you get are some, I guess, a little more enriched conversations about how stories impact different Indigenous people in different ways. But also you see the common threads throughout, right? Like we can do a, 
a discussion about, um, you know, we just did Richard Van Camp's The Lesser Blessed uh, most recently. Um, he is from the Northwest Territories. He's of Tlisho descent. And we talked to Leela Gilde, who's Dene from the Northwest Territories. Um, I'm Nishnabe from the Great Lakes region, right? And Jennifer's uh, uh, Meshkego Cree from Northern Ontario. But there are things in a book like that that we all sort of latch on to. And it's sort of, it's really beautiful to see how we interpret different things and how we come together on certain details at the same time. So um, it's been really eye-opening for me too. Thanks. I think something that that podcast that, that you do so beautifully is it feels really scholarly, but really accessible. Um, like you feel like you're sitting in on a conversation that's operating on a lot of different levels. Um, and I also think that um, you do such a range of books that are both contemporary books, but also mm -hmm. classics. And I think that that's a bit different than some other um, uh, book shows, I guess. Um, and I think it's also neat that you don't have the author come on, but you have people talking about the book who the book means a lot to them, um, but it's, it shifts the conversation in an interesting way. Yeah, that's and that has been kind of a challenge, actually. Uh, that was always Jennifer's idea from the beginning is not to have the author themselves come on, but rather someone who may connect with the book. Uh, and and I think we, we reach out to the authors every time we do it to let them know. And, and they're like, oh, you're not going to invite me on, you're going to invite somebody else. So I think now that people are aware of our show's identity, like they they're they're cool with that. Um, but yeah, that, that's been a fun, fun sort of way to approach it as well. Thanks. Um, so I guess one of my questions is why podcasting? Why was that the medium that you picked for these two um, to focus on with these two projects? Um, so I mean, while you've worked in broadcast radio for so long, um, why didn't you and Jennifer decide to do it as a broadcast show? What did what opportunity did podcasting give? Well, Jennifer originally envisioned it as something that could be on the radio. Uh, but you know, getting something like that online and together um, takes, uh, you know, a huge effort and there are different sort of um, factors at play too. You know, you have to lobby CBC or Element FM or whoever else the broadcaster is to get you on the radio, you know. Um, so podcasting just offered us the flexibility to do it whenever we wanted and to not really um, fall in line with whatever typical formats there are in the radio, right? Like sometimes we can do an episode that's just a half hour, sometimes maybe 45 minutes. Um, and, you know, just having that flexibility, I think has been really beneficial for us. And, sorry, we have a little visitor in the, in the room there. Um, so yeah, like I think she realized that we would have more freedom and that's why she wanted to go the podcasting route. And uh, it, it was a pretty, um, I think, uh, beneficial sort of outcome for us and how everything came together in a pretty smooth way. And um, the feedback has been very positive so far. We're very grateful. That's great, thank you. And Chioki, I mean, you also have huge experience with all sorts of different NPR stations. And I know that um, Virginia Public Media is a partner of the center. Why did you want your students to focus on podcasting as opposed to um, small segments for broadcast? Well, I think that in terms of media production, you have more access to podcasting than you do broadcasting and more access to podcasting than you do certain types of even like video production right so uh so it's it's more the accessibility is is, is one thing i think the other thing is that because podcasting is this like audio medium that requires for you to speak being an effective podcaster will also make you an effective communicator generally speaking right like if you know how to do the writing to be properly persuasive and listenable in a podcast, you'll be able to do that whenever you're just like talking to the person at your job interview. So I see there's a, a an intersection of certain types of regular life skills that come along with people who are able to do podcasting well. Thanks, and you also use podcasting really directly in education. I think that, you know, before the center, you developed a course podcasting while black. Um, can you talk a little bit about like why you started really directly using that in a more formal um, like university course? Well, I think that the, the general truth is that unless students are very actively pursuing literature degrees, they mostly don't know how to write. Yeah. 
Um, and because, I mean, well, I'll tell you that. That's true here in America, where our public schools have some issues. Um, but they, so then they need a way to work on their communication methods. And when you do podcasting, you can mix the writing and the speaking together, right? We always, we often talk about like taking the public speaking class or taking the writing class. Podcasting requires you to do both. So I think that that's good. Um, I think that also it's good to think about the way that words live, like the way that they, they, they live when spoken. So in many of my theory classes, we'll read the stuff and, and they'll read the stuff. But then when I say, hey, I, I need you to now like say that back to me, they're like really like, whoa, hold on. Wait, wait a minute. That wasn't part of the deal, you know. Uh, but if you, if you start with the, the idea that this is going to be a thing that we broadcast or that we that we like put put out there. So you need to work out how you're going to say it on the microphone, then the writing skills and the speaking skills go up at the same time. And once again, it, it is my hope that students will be able to take that out into the world and be better communicators. Thanks. Can I just in one more minute, just push you on that a little bit more. I'd love to hear if you have any student success stories that you'd want to share um, of students who uh, really um, took the challenge. Oh, well, let's see. Uh, one of my students became an Air Media New Voices fellow. Uh, a couple of my students have gone on to work at NPR, like either internships or like a, a proper like employee uh, position. Um, one of my students went to the local community radio station uh, to and, and did uh, like a regular show and is now the subject of like this documentary that's being produced. So like things are things are going I like I don't it's it's not like as good as I would like it to be right like because I I want like all of the students to be like our rhetorical skills increase tenfold in Chokey's class yeah, right but I, that's not really <laughs> that's not going down just yet that's a pretty solid success rate already <laughs> thank you um in terms of you know why we picked podcasting um, you've mentioned accessibility. That was a big one for us too. And I know, Bob, you mentioned, I think on one of the podcasts, I think it, maybe it was Eden Robinson, that you envisioned this as a resource that's available on a long term, the way that maybe a broadcast piece isn't. Um, you know, the CBC doesn't keep their work up for forever on their website either, right? Like this is something that can sustain. And that was a big thing for us. Um, knowing that people could go there if they are accessing it online, they can get the transcripts. So it's a lot more accessible that way. They can replay it. We also keep the podcast pretty short so that um, people can, I think Susan Scott came up with the idea that it shouldn't necessarily, for our particular piece, take longer than maybe having a cup of coffee, you know, like expecting people to fit that into their day. Um, so I guess one thing I'd love to hear from, maybe we'll start with you this time, Bob, is what kind of potentials do you think there are for the medium of podcasting? Or what shows do you hope get made that maybe haven't been made yet? Well, I think uh, one of the silver linings to the pandemic has been, you know, the migration online. And I think the abundance of new technologies to access voices in this way, right? Like I haven't seen Jennifer in person in probably about five years. You know, we didn't meet at all to discuss uh, story keepers. You know, it's been done entirely virtually. Um, that has had some challenges, of course, but I think, you know, um, hopefully our example, and we follow other examples as well, um, there have been many podcast uh, projects come up uh, during the pandemic. I think people will learn just, you know, how, I guess, uh, possible it is um, and how potentially cost effective it could be. You know, you do have to put some money up front. Um, I met, as I mentioned, we got some funding to do that, but, um, you know, if, if you have an idea uh, and you have a, a strong focus, um, I think there's an appetite for almost anything. And again, the pandemic has really uh, condensed our worlds uh, even further in that like we have the time to learn about new experiences, listen to different types of discussions, read more books and so on. Uh, so that, that's my hope that, you know, we can, especially young people can see it as, as a viable venue for their voices and their experiences and so on. 
And um, yeah, and I think within indigenous communities, especially within our artistic indigenous communities, there is a lot of support um, because, you know, the people who came before us always made sure that there was space for us at the table um, to speak our truths and so on. So I think the circle just gets wider and wider with each subsequent generation. Uh, and I think podcasting has the potential to blow that open even wider, uh, which is really exciting. Thanks, Juan. Um, Chioki, you also obviously you're spending a lot of time thinking about the potential of podcasts. Are there any um, uh, potentials that you think still haven't been realized or any shows that you wish would be made? Well, so I think that from an educational perspective, I like the idea of uh, people using podcasting just in terms of a personal development record. So think about it like artists have sketchbooks and people write in journals. So I'd like to see podcasting used as a, a way for someone to like develop their skills. And, and maybe it's not even a thing that they release uh, necessarily like for public consumption, but it's just a, a way to work on one's uh, like presentation. Right. Uh, I think that that's a that's a that's a thing that we should probably be doing more of. And, and it's something that I've, I learned because I did a lot of this like kind of presentational development on air because of working at NPR. Right. And so if you can imagine if I like the little clips, I just do like I just read ads. It's not like anything major. However, when you I, I hear an ad on the radio that's from like last week versus when I hear one that came from like two years ago, I'm like, I get that cringe. Like, I'm like, Ooh, like, why did I pronounce it like that? Like, what was that about? You know? Um, but you can only really notice this about yourself. If you are recording stuff, like thinking it through, thinking about your delivery, the whole, that whole jam. So I think that that would be good. Uh, and then also, I think that personally, uh, I like the idea of media that explicitly models critical perspectives. So it's very easy to listen to media that has a perspective and then just uses it to do its thing, but doesn't make the perspective explicit. I would like to see more stuff that explains that this is the way of thinking like this is how we got to this point because uh the uh like the the fact that these perspectives are mostly hidden and that there are so many of them is a long-term bad i think for culture thanks chioki that kind of leads into my next question and i might um ask you to start uh this time so in an essay by Tressie McMillan Cottom, um, who teaches at UNC Chapel Hills High School, she's a MacArthur Fellow, and she runs the podcast Here to Slay with Roxane Gay, she says, there are a lot of reasons why podcasting has been so white in sound and representation. There's the free time to invest in a lot of free labor, feedback loops for white male consumer interests, and the cost to do a good podcast. I also suspect that the medium has resonated with white men creators and listeners because its traditional format is modeled so precisely on the white rhetorical tradition, a great man at a podium, a passive audience and an argument. It's very Greek. So I guess my question is, do you agree with that? And if so, like, how do we disrupt that? I mean, I guess that's probably true. Like, I don't, I don't know how else to explain the success of a lot of these like top 10 podcasts that are just like, just white guys talking. They're just kind of talking, you know? Um, so yeah, so it, it's generally true. I think that one of the things that I heard, for instance, is that uh, if there's like a good job available, like at, let's say at a, a production house, like a, a, a person of general privilege can wait around for longer or be an intern for longer, and not have to take a job somewhere else so that they can wait around for the position to become open so that they can then work at the position. You see what I'm saying? So there's, I think there's definitely like some stuff going on with like this idea of, of having the leeway to work as free labor. So this is probably true of, uh, you know, like just people who have a bit more privilege or whatever. Um, but in terms of the possibility of disruption, I mean, I don't, I don't think that it's a, it, it's not a thing that needs to be disrupted, like white guys can continue to do their podcasts or whatever, and, and it's fine. However, more media, media needs to uh, be made 
that carries a different kind of narrative or, uh, or a different kind of perspective. So I think that one of the problems that I see is that whenever people say they want to make a podcast and you, t and you ask them more questions, whoever it is, their idea of what a podcast is sounds like what the white guys do. You see what I'm saying? So that's the thing that needs to be broken. Well, what we what we need are, are more podcasts that uh, that introduce different ways of sounding like a podcast. And that can be a difficult thing and you have to do a lot of experimentation. But then also, I think that there are just some very original voices out there that don't know that they are original voices and that those cats need a lot of support. So that's one of the things that the media center does. And hopefully that's a message that we can spread, especially, especially about just like sharing other kinds of good quality podcasts. Thanks, Shoki. Um, Bob, did you want to weigh in on that at all? Yeah, I would just follow what Shoki said earlier about uh, genuine oratory, right? Of people being able to speak in their own ways as themselves, because the white male voice is the default for all media, you know, that we've known here in North America. And uh, when I was working at CBC, like that was very much what I was conditioned to do, you know, like to to ask in these very enunciated ways and to deliver in that way too. Um, and I mentioned in one of our earlier episodes of Story Keepers that like, I was excited to do this podcast because I didn't have to do as much code switching anymore. You know, like I could be myself a little bit more on the podcast, you know, and I don't have like a heavy res accent or anything anyway, but that that's my upbringing. I grew up on the res. I have that slang, that vernacular, you know? Um, so I think, Offering that sonic diversity uh, more widely is a form of disruption, you know, because people's ears are going to gravitate towards their community. And once word of mouth spreads that, hey, there's this podcast of people from a community much like mine talking about real stuff that relates to me. Um, I want to I want to hear that. And I'm going to spread the word. I'm going to share that with others and so on, you know. So, um, yeah, just just to agree with Joby, like. Like the white dude podcasts are always going to be there and they should be there because there's mostly white dudes out there, you know, but uh, that's not to say that we can't add to the mix, you know, and, and perpetually we can continue to add to the mix. There are more voices that still need to be represented in podcasting as well. So um, I'm excited to see what comes. Thanks. Um, just one thing I might add is uh, one of the things when we were planning parallel careers is that we wanted, we got some funding because we knew we wanted to pay our guests, which is um, not that common with podcasting, but I think Wab, you also, you pay the, the visiting scholars or the visiting artists who come to chat. Um, and I know that's not possible for all podcasts, like it might not be possible, Chioki, for your students when they're, you know, they're starting a podcast if they're interviewing someone. But I think especially when I think about the kind of podcast that Parallel Careers is, like I'm asking people to share their expertise. These are not always tenured, you know, tenured professors. Um, and I'm asking for their time and their expertise. So I feel like we need to, to compensate that. And I think um, it'd be nice if there were more opportunities that were paid like that. Um, one thing that I might say, I'm um, talking about like those, um, having content that comes out that doesn't always have to sound like it's um, a particular say NPR or CBC formula. Um, I think about, I, was, I, was, uh, I think we're all a similar age and I definitely, I remember like GeoCities when it came out like it was the first time that a lot of people had the chance to start their own website. And, um, you know, it had no design qualities that were mandated, right? Like people had like flashing plaid, like backgrounds and like neon text. And I think it's great that some of that shifted in terms of accessibility. Like, you know, we need to have high contrast text. We need to have sizes, things like that. But I sometimes wonder, you know, what are we, you know, when you think about website design now, a lot of people have like a WordPress site or a Squarespace site, and it's like a template that's been very designed. And I think a lot of our things in our lives have become these expectations of design. And I wonder with podcasting, I think that um, we want to equip people to have a really professional sound, or we have this idea of what that, you know, for them to get listeners, what it will have to sound like. But what are we missing by it not being a bit more, um, that kind of geocities or that idea of like it could it doesn't have to be so polished um maybe uh Bob, do you want to start 
just about the desire to have good audio? Is that another question? Yeah, I guess about like what, like how do we balance having sort of audio standards with mm -hmm. um, having room for experimentation? Yeah, um, well, I also think that people have become, like listeners in general, have become, um, you know, a little less discerning when it comes to audio quality. Um, given the pandemic, you know, we, we know that if we listen to like CBC radio, we can expect to hear a Zoom interview or, um, you know, something from the field that doesn't sound as crisp as like a professional mic, right? Uh, because we haven't been able to like get together in person, face to face to do interviews and so on. Uh, so like we wanted to make sure that we had the best audio quality as possible. So we, we each got mics, like I got, you know, a Blue Yeti mic that I, I traded a friend for and Jennifer got one similar. But um, the challenge with not being together in person was she has some technical difficulties setting it all up. So our earlier episodes, um, her mic is, is kind of useless because it's not in, in use for the, you know, the Zoom calls that we recorded on, right? We eventually figured that out. And, and thankfully, you know, our, our listeners are very forgiving because I'm not necessarily sure there's that ultimate expectation to have like crisp audio, um, just as long as people's voices are coherent and clear enough, right, to follow along with the, with the discussion. Um, but yeah, you know, in terms of that experimentation, I, you know, I would just recommend people starting out to, uh, yeah, just try to be as, as clear as possible, hold whatever recording device they have as close to their face as they can. And, and, you know, what comes out, I think if it's a good story, people are going to want to listen to it regardless, you know? Um, and I think that's the beauty of storytelling, which is what, you know, at the foundation of all podcasting, essentially. Thanks, Bob. Um, Chioki, how do you uh, negotiate with that with your students? Like, what advice do you give them on that? Well, uh, I'm ashamed to say that I'm a quality, uh, you know, police. I'm the quality police. So the and the and the the reason that I am is because it's it's true that you know if if the quality can be anything then there are maybe a few more opportunities for production. But in my experience, if the quality is too low, whatever you're making is not gonna be as listenable. Like ear fatigue is real. So even though, yes, I can expect that there might be a Zoom interview on the thing sometime, if everybody is on Zoom or if like, you know, like the other day I heard a, someone sent me a podcast, like, what do you think of this sound? And it was clearly like someone who, was recording a podcast with three people and and they're like here's the computer and they were all like over here <laughs> and i was like bro i can't do it anyway um now that said i think that uh the quality can be anything so long as it's like it's contextualized does that does that make sense so if the narrative calls for it if, if something about the nature of the podcast requires that the quality be like, you know, not optimal in terms of regular technical standards, then I think that that is, is very important. I should also know that in, in the, if we're thinking about ge GeoCities, it's not simply about like what the quality is. It's also about like what the possibility is of what you might hear whenever you click on the podcast, right? Because like when you, that, GeoCities was, if we recall, it was like, actually like streets and stuff right so like you could like you could turn a corner and encounter something entirely new and so one of one of our issues is just thinking through what those things could be because while it is the case that audio is a you know is itself like a sandbox that we can all play in not everyone knows what could be a thing that a thing could sound like so like that for me that education is like very important so i'm always sharing podcasts that have like a different kind of sound or a different kind of narrative structure so that people can get the idea and be like shaken out of like the white guy assumption um, of what a podcast is. Thanks, Chioki. So I'm just gonna do a quick reminder that if you have any questions um, for the panelists, please type them in the chat. We're gonna be switching over to Q&A pretty soon. Um, before we do that, I did wanna ask, uh, what would you, how would you recommend people get started? Um, uh, educating themselves on, you know, how to, to create a podcast if they have an idea, um, other kinds of resources, whether it's, you know, technical or in terms of, you know, Chioki, what you're talking about in terms of finding the best way to tell the story. It's not, it's like public speaking plus writing, like those, those kind of tools as well. 
Um, maybe Chioki, do you want to start this time and walk? Well, I think an excellent thing to do might be to check out the Community Media Center website. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so here, here's, the, here's the whole thing. Here's, here's how it works. So if, if you go to uh, the, Media Center, uh, the Media Center website, the, the thing is, is that if you sign up for our mailing list, then you will uh, get access to um, our past programs that have been recorded. And we have had like all of your favorite podcasters come and like do presentations um so uh, and oh that's the other thing that i wanted to tell you about but uh so then the, the next thing is you should find this thing called the the npr training blueprint um it's right there on the training.npr.org website and uh what it is is it, it is a like a work sheet a work group uh yeah like a work is it worksheet something like that that will help you uh take your podcast idea and refine it into a pitch. So that's that I think is a very good uh, thing to do, because if you're right at the very beginning, a lot of people don't quite know the elements that are needed to start with the podcast. But the training blueprint you know, makes you think about it and write it out and then form a pitch. And then that, I think, is like very, very, very interesting, you know, or very good to do. Yeah. Um, and so, sorry, and then I'll, I'll just note, like, as a, as a, by way of an example of what is accessible at the Community Media Center, I'm just going to drop this in the, in the chat for everyone. This is a talk that was given by Ramtin Arablui of NPR's Throughline, and he said so many things about, like, what it takes to make a good podcast, and it's so good, you know? Um, that that's the kind of uh, programming that we can that we can help with. I think also a simple thing is like explain your podcast thing to a friend and then ask them to explain it back to you. That's great advice. Can I just ask, um, can Canadians sign up for these courses or is it like, is it restricted geographically at all? For no, 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 it's all it's all accessible, like it's all always accessible yeah i mean every all of our programming is hybrid anyway so like you don't actually have to be here to take part or see any of this stuff you know okay. yeah um bob any advice that you wanted to share yeah i just say understand that there are all different kinds of ways to create a podcast and i would advise people to listen to as many different ones as possible when they're trying to hone in on their idea and to know that you know some shows have way more resources than others right and some will sound a little more polished um a little more lively and so on and others may sound a little more sort of diy or, or sort of grassroots you know um so you, uh, you could want to go either way or find somewhere in the middle but I would suggest following up or reaching out to somebody who's created a podcast that you like and ask for some advice. So when Jennifer and I first got started, um, a friend of mine named Rick Harp, he lives in Winnipeg. He runs this, I guess, uh, independent media organization called Media Indigena, and he has his own monthly podcast. So we reached out to him and just just ask for some advice on how to get started, you know, how to register for podcast hosting, you know, the kind of gear we should get and, you know, um, what our expectations should be, right? Like in terms of download numbers or reaching an audience or social media activity and so on. So um, I, I am always accessible for those kinds of questions. So feel free to reach out to me if, if you like. But uh, yeah, that'd be a key piece of advice too, is just uh, find another podcaster and uh, try to get some info from them. Thanks. So we have a question from an audience member. Um, how do you see podcasts fitting into a writer's life? Um, how can a podcast become profitable for a writer? And then I might add, because both of you mentioned it a little bit, um, how do you find listeners? Um, once you have your podcast, how do you make sure it's actually getting um, heard? Um, well, maybe do you want to start this? Yeah, for sure. What was the first part of that question again? Sorry, Claire. Yeah, I, I grouped them all together like a big question sandwich. Um, how do you see podcasts fitting into a writer's life? Oh, um, I think it can be very beneficial. Uh, for me, just engaging in the process has helped me become a little more conversational. And I think that's something I always try to apply to my own writing too, you know, um, just to be as 
conversation as possible for dialogue, obviously, but also in exposition and action and so on, you know, and uh, part of that um, is, is digging into my sort of journalistic skills at the same time, because as a broadcaster, I had to write really active and sort of punchy uh, sentences for radio and TV stories, right? And I had an editor, Susan Renouf, the one who edited Moon of the Crested Snow. Um, she advised me to, to sort of tap into that as much as I could and be as conversational as I can in, in my literary uh, projects. And I find when I do uh, story keepers with Jennifer, we don't really script that much. You know, we have some basic ideas of what we want to talk about. Uh, but when I try to form my ideas of what I want to discuss about a particular book, you know, I find it really just gets gets the gears turning, right? And then it sort of motivates me to do some writing afterwards. Also, because we're talking about literature too, you know, that's that's a pretty good motiv motivating factor as well. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's how I see it fitting in for sure. That's great, thank you. Um, Chioki, what do you think? Um, both in terms of fitting into a creative life, but then also finding listeners. Um, okay, the best way to get other people to listen to your podcast is for you or your podcast to be featured on other podcasts. That's the, that's the general, that's the advice that everybody gives. So if you want people to listen to your show, you need to be a guest on some other shows, do a good job, or maybe do some promotion with other shows and that whole jam, right? That's, that's the thing. I think that also always just know that your first reaching out to your immediate community, right? And you should strive to have an episode that is so good that people will want to share it. Like you, you, you want to, so if you have an episode, so if you have an episode that you're particularly proud of or that people say that one's good, you need to lead with that one and not just not be like, Oh, listen to my show. It's got like, I've got like 20 episodes on the thing. Like you need to give them that one and then try and see if you can encourage some shareability. But apart from that, try and be featured on other podcasts. That's, that's the general idea. And I think you, you, you might have, you have a good idea. I think what my thoughts are about how it fits into a general creative uh, life, right? Because I think that the the thing that I was trained to do to like write in this kind of obscure academic way is trash now. Like no one cares, right? Like more people heard my philosophy on my little everything is alive episode than have ever downloaded my dissertation, right? So uh, like trying to learn to communicate in a podcast like way is perhaps one of the best ways to make your ideas move far. Thank you. Um, we have another question in the chat, which is, um, how do teachers who are interested in teaching podcasting, what resources could they find in terms of how to do that? And then also, you know, where can they seek out some uh, interesting podcasts that would be great for sharing with students? Um, Chioki, maybe I'll throw that back to you just because you are teaching already with podcasts. Yeah, so there's NPR training, there's uh, transom.org. Uh, and then there is, there's a third one that I am definitely forgetting right now, but those two are the major things. So transom.org and NPR training are, they have a bunch of articles that can help you get some stuff uh, worked out. I think there's a couple, I think that if you're an educator, you might have access to LinkedIn learning and there's a few like how to podcast things on there. It's like a forgotten resource that LinkedIn learning, there's actually a lot of good stuff on there. Um, and then what was the second question? Oh, uh, what, what, how do you find podcasts, et cetera, et cetera? Take your pencils down. One, the secret adventures of black people. Two, appearances, which is from a, a production house called Mermaid Palace. Three, have you heard of George's podcast? That is the name of the podcast. Have you heard of George's podcast? S start, start there. And, uh, and and it will be good. Uh, Wab, anything to add to that? Um, no, I, I would just say try to seek out as many literary podcasts as possible. Um, I think the ones that talk to authors directly are, are great too, even though that's not what we do with our podcast. You know, I'm thinking of uh, Can't Lit um, or yours, Claire, obviously. Um, 
you know, uh, so many others. Uh, Queers at the End of the World is another good one. Um, and uh, in, in that sense, I think you'll um, just, you know, broaden those perspectives on literary discussions specifically in, uh, in the podcasting world. Uh, but from an educational perspective, I'm not an educator, so I don't, uh, I will defer that uh, to Chioki, the, the expert there, which he had some great advice already, so. That's great. Um, I guess uh, we only have you know five minutes left. Um, uh, Chioki, you mentioned a couple uh, favorite podcasts. Um, uh, well, was there anything that you want to add to? Um, uh, you just added a couple of them to that. Um, absolute must listen. So I just, I'm just going to jump into um, with uh, our show. It's hugely influenced by Song Exploder, um, which I would highly recommend by Rishikesh Hiraway. Um, and the big thing for that was that it, uh, the interviewer isn't um, in the podcast at all. So um, it sounds more like a personal essay, which we were trying to do with that in terms of format. So I guess um, just to narrow it down, um, one of the questions in the Q&A was um, alternate formats. So any other podcasts that come to mind that offer a really interesting alternate format? Um, Chioki or Wab, you can jump in with that one. No, the ones that I mentioned are that. Um, and then also uh, there's, uh, oh, there's one called Richard's Famous Food Podcast. Now it is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a white guy's podcast, but a, a, as you'll hear, the production is like not normal. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's also a good one to, to listen to, you know. Um, uh, and then, uh, there's, there's one that I like, although it is, uh, from a production standpoint, it's a pretty heavy lift, which is Invisibilia. And then lastly, I just want to say that we are going to have Rishikesh Hirway at the media center for a talk in the spring. So sign up for our, our mailing list. Yeah, I would add, um, there's one called the Apocrypha Chronicles, um, which was uh, produced out of Vancouver over the pandemic. It is uh, a heavy lift in terms of the production as well, and it involves uh, some actors. But basically, what they did was um, asked uh, various artists across the country to record certain reflections over the course of the pandemic and then send them in. And then they cut them all together in this really uh, very sophisticated and very polished way. Um, but it's just, it gives you an idea of, of sonically what can be accomplished, you know, with the right resources. And yeah, it, it's a little more on the experimental side as well. Uh, it's dystopian very much at the same time too. So if that's your jam, uh, check that out. Thank you. And then I think we have time for one last question. And this one is top pieces of advice to make podcasts pop. Um, I might say, I think that, uh, I mean, it's a pretty saturated medium in some ways, like, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of podcasts out there, but I do think that um, just the way that, you know, every individual human voice is interesting because it's, you know, reinterprets um, the world, right? Um, each person reinterprets it differently. I think that um, the more, uh, uh, true to um, what you want to say, um, the more refined your storytelling can be in terms of really trying to hone that in. Maybe that would be my piece of advice for making it pop is just having a really clear vision for yourself, even if it's a different aesthetic than um, what you're hearing. Robert Chioki? Hey, so one time uh, a professor friend sent me a podcast and was like, what do you think of this podcast? We're thinking about applying for some funding for it or whatever. And I listened to it and it was, no joke, five minutes of introductions, like five minutes, like the first person said, hey, welcome to the thing. This is a show. And then the next person, oh, hey, so we do the blah, blah, blah. five minutes of introduction. Just start your show. Yeah, uh, I would say if you have the money um, to invest in in some of the things that may make it sound a little more lively or vibrant, um, we hired a musician to create our theme song. His name's Noel Habel. 
Uh, and he, yeah, he, he created the Story Keepers theme. Um, also, you know, I talked a lot about, you know, being laid back and not having a script and so on. At the same time, you do need a bit of a plan before you sit down and record every time, right? Because there have been times when, you know, we get started and because we're not face to face, you know, it's just like we catch up for a couple of minutes before we get talking. And it's like, you know, it's kind of boring just to hear, oh, hey, Jen, how you doing? Oh, good, Wob. What's the weather like in Sudbury? Blah, 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 right? And like, I can just hear the, you know, they act is going uh, if we carry on with that too much so um yeah so i have a bit of a plan you know even though you want it to be conversational um, make sure you there are some markers you want to hit along the way to keep it as compelling a conversation as possible thank you that's a great place i think um to wrap it up uh thank you both so much for uh sharing your insights it's such a pleasure to be here with both of you and um yeah thank you again Yes, and I want to say thank you to all three of you. This has been such an interesting uh, session. I'm a fan of podcasts, but now I feel like I've only scratched the surface. <laughs> I've got a lot of a lot of uh, listening to do, and, and I love the recommendations, which uh, I'll definitely look into. So thank you for your time, your generosity. I think uh, a lot of people really got a lot of insight into into the world of podcasting and inspired too. I think you know we're all inspired to make our own podcast now, I think. So um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we have one more day left of our festival. We have an event at tomorrow at one. It's uh, with Kathleen Winter and uh, Jean McNeil. So please join us then and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This has been uh, a lot of fun. Um, I, I always have a good experience when I hang out with Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you're, you very much. You're welcome anytime. Really yeah, this has been a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. So thanks for uh, moderating, Claire, and great to chat with you, Choki. And thanks for having us, Pamela. Hope to have you again. Bye now. Bye-bye.